Below it were plate glass doors. Baker pulled one open. It sucked against rubber seals. The backup pushed me through. The door sucked shut behind me. Inside it was cool again. Everything was white and chrome. Lights were fluorescent. It looked like a bank or an insurance office. There was carpet. A desk sergeant stood behind a long reception counter. The way the place looked, he should have said, How may I help you, sir? But he said nothing. He just looked at me. Behind him was a huge, open-plan space. A dark-haired woman in uniform was sitting at a wide, low desk. She had been doing paperwork on a keyboard. Now she was looking at me. I stood there, an officer on each elbow. Stevenson was backed up against the reception counter. His shotgun was pointed at me. Baker stood there, looking at me. The desk sergeant and the woman in uniform were looking at me. I looked back at them. Then I was walked to the left. They stopped me in front of a door. Baker swung it open and I was pushed into a room. It was an interview facility. No windows. A white table and three chairs. Carpet. In the top corner of the room, a camera. The air in the room was set very cold. I was still wet from the rain. I stood there, and Baker ferreted into every pocket. My belongings made a small pile on the table. A roll of cash, some coins, receipts, tickets, scraps. Baker checked the newspaper and left it in my pocket, glanced at my watch and left it on my wrist. He wasn't interested in those things. Everything else was swept into a large Ziploc bag, a bag made for people with more in their pockets than I carry. The bag had a white panel printed on it. Stevenson wrote some kind of a number on the panel. Baker told me to sit down. Then they all left the room. Stevenson carried the bag with my stuff in it. They went out, then closed the door, and I heard the lock turning. It had a heavy, well-greased sound, the sound of precision, the sound of a big steel lock. Sounded like a lock that would keep me in. I figured they would leave me isolated for a while. It usually happens that way. Isolation causes an urge to talk. An urge to talk can become an urge to confess. A brutal arrest followed by an hour's isolation is pretty good strategy. But I figured wrong. They hadn't planned an hour's isolation. Maybe their second slight tactical mistake. Baker unlocked the door and stepped back in. He carried a plastic cup of coffee. Then he signaled the uniformed woman into the room, the one I'd seen at her desk in the open area. The heavy lock clicked behind her. She carried a metal flight case, which she set on the table. She clicked it open and took out a long black number holder. In it were white plastic numbers. She handed it to me with that brusque, apologetic sympathy that dental nurses use. I took it in my cuffed hands, squinted down to make sure it was the right way up, and held it under my chin. The woman took an ugly camera out of the case and sat opposite me. She rested her elbows on the table to brace the camera, sitting forward. Her breasts rested on the edge of the table. This was a good-looking woman. Dark hair, great eyes. I stared at her and smiled. The camera clicked and flashed. Before she could ask, I turned sideways on the chair for the profile, held the long number against my shoulder, and stared at the wall. The camera clicked and flashed again. I turned back and held out the number. Two-handed, because of the cuffs. She took it from me with that pursed grin which says, Yes, it's unpleasant, but it's necessary. Like the dental nurse. Then she took out the fingerprint gear, a crisp ten card already labeled with a number. The thumbs.